Second case on the docket for Tuesday, March 29th, 2022, is appeal number 122039, State of Kansas versus Johnny C. White, Subject County, briefs both sides. Council, will you please come to the lectern and enter your appearances? May it please the court, the appellant Johnny White appears through Casper Shire, Kansas Appellate Defender Office. And Your Honor, could I please reserve three minutes for rebuttal? Friend. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Assistant District Attorney Julie Kuhn on behalf of the state present and ready for argument. Fire. Thank you, Your Honor. Again, Casper Shire appearing for Johnny White and may it please his court. In 2017, Johnny White was accused of a sex offense dating back to 2009. When he spoke with law enforcement about those accusations, he denied them and he agreed to take a polygraph exam. No report of that polygraph exam was ever uh, produced, but Johnny's interrogators told him that he had bombed the test, that he was lying, and that he needed to confess to give his accuser closure. After about two hours and 45 minutes of interrogation, Johnny told a detective that his accuser was not lying. And Johnny's confession featured prominently at his trial. But the jury never heard about the polygraph exam because the district court at the state's request and over defense objection uh, excluded any and all reference to the fact that the confession had come on the heels of a polygraph. Johnny also objected to the state's use of a tearful confession to a separate crime and to the state amending its complaint on the fourth day of trial uh, to expand the charge date range in this case by nearly a year. Johnny ultimately chose not to testify uh, in this case after, based on the limitations on his intended testimony from the polygraph order. Johnny was acquitted on one count of aggravated indecent liberties with a child, but convicted on a second count. And my plan here today is to start with the uh, polygraph issue and to focus on that issue. Uh, I'm certainly prepared to talk about the other issues and to take questions on those issues, but if I don't get to them, uh, I will submit those issues on the briefing. Let me start by asking you on the polygraph issue. In both your brief to the Court of Appeals and to us, you say that the officers tricked your client in regards to the polygraph results. I don't see any evidence that, uh, that, the, that the investigators falsified what the results would be or th that we even know what the results of the polygraph were. What's the basis for your saying that they tricked it? This court has said that the polygraph is an inherently unreliable test. Uh, using, to tell somebody that they failed a polygraph is uh, kind of an oxymoron. You cannot fail an unreliable test. So going into an interrogation and telling somebody, you bombed that polygraph, we know you're lying, you might as well confess, is coercion. So the were you expecting the jury to take some sort of common knowledge about the inherent unreliability of polygraphs uh, in order to make this argument that by telling him he bombed, uh, that he was being coerced. Well, Your Honor, I think once the polygraph evidence comes in, it, it comes with a limiting instruction. And that's what defense counsel was asking for below. A limiting instruction that tells the jury, you can consider this evidence to determine the credibility of Johnny's confession, but polygraph evidence um, is, is uh, not used for the purpose of determining whether Johnny was speaking truthfully or untruthfully when he submitted to this test. You didn't make a proffer that you had an expert to say anything about polygraph, right? No. And so the second you start fighting about the results of this test, it seems natural that the state's gonna need to come in and go, you know, really, uh, what was it? Atterbury was the, the polygraph examiner. Uh, he's really, really good at this and he knows and these results, he, you know, he was telling the truth. 
seems extraordinarily prejudicial to the defendant to be wading into that area. And I don't see how a limiting instruction takes away from that prejudice. Well, respectfully, Your Honor, I don't think evidence that uh, the the polygraph administrator, um, you know, I, I'm sure he would take the stand and say, I've been doing this a long time. I know what I'm doing. I trust polygraphs. I think they're great. But the fact is this court's case law says otherwise. The fact is this court's case law says the polygraphs are not trustworthy. And so I, I just don't see any reason to dive down that, that, that rabbit hole. I don't see any reason to relitigate the veracity of polygraph tests when this court has said that they are not reliable. Counsel, That's why we exclude reference to polygraphs. I mean, the district court was following our case law, wasn't it? I think the district court overread the case law, Your Honor. Um, sir, yes, the district court was relying on this court's what case law. What evidence was it that the defendant wanted to put in front of the jury? Uh, Johnny testified at the pretrial hearing on the uh, motion to suppress that also doubled as a uh, motion in limine trying to keep the polygraph evidence out. Um, and he said that he, he, he didn't understand polygraph evidence. Uh, he said that he felt pressured to confess by the polygraph, <clears throat> by the officer's use of the polygraph to tell him that he was lying. But how is it? The confession is not challenged here. I mean, a minute ago, you said it was coercive, but that's not that's not actually a correct statement of the law, is it? Um, law enforcement officers are permitted. I mean, they can they can tell a, a suspect that, you know. His buddy gave him up when that's completely untrue. There's nothing our case law says that's not outside the bounds of what law enforcement can do. And as much as I don't like that case law, I have to agree that's right, Your Honor. Uh, but what happened here, uh, and, and the district court did do the voluntariness analysis. We had a Jackson v. Deno. The court determined that this was voluntary. And that's the court's job, to determine whether this confession gets to the jury at all. Then we have a separate question that's for the jury and not for the judge, which is, do you believe this? Do you believe that this confession is accurate? And that question needs to go to the jury, even though the court has found that the confession is voluntary. And it's the How same. How does the exist? That's the, I'm, I appreciate that answer because that gets to the, to me, the part of this case that I can't quite make the leap, which is how does, the, how is the, fact that law enforcement said you failed the polygraph test, how does that, how is that relevant to the credibility of the confession? Because Johnny wanted to get on the stand, as he did at the pretrial hearing, and say, this is what contained, Crane v. Kentucky talks about. When, there, when a confession is in play, when and the accused is trying to deal with a false confession at trial, they have to, have to be able to explain to the jury why they said they didn't when they really did not. And here, the reason is that investigators told Johnny he'd bombed a polygraph, that Johnny didn't understand how polygraphs work, that Johnny thought he was cooked, and that Johnny uh, confessed to, to give his, you know, in part because they were, you know, hitting him up not only with the fact that he bombed this polygraph, but also that there was a girl out there that needed closure. And that's, you know, based on his history, that's an issue that Johnny would have been very sensitive to. And that is why he confessed to these offenses. And he needed to be able to tell the jury, this is why I confessed. Because he couldn't do that, he had very little chance of succeeding at trial. And when you do that, <clears throat> if that, if that testimony comes into ev to evidence, I want to go back to, I think, Justice Biles' point. What does that open up then for the state to introduce? Doesn't that then allow the state to, uh, for example, um, produce testimony um, relevant to the reliability of that examination and other circumstances that, that um, would suggest that the polygraph was administered in accord with prevailing standards in, in the industry? I think it certainly opens the door, Your Honor, to evidence that, at least in the opinion of this evaluator, Johnny failed the polygraph. Otherwise, this evidence makes no sense. Um, even from Johnny's standpoint, it doesn't make any sense to go in and say, I went in, I took a polygraph, I passed it, but I confessed anyway. And that's certainly not what he was trying to put on. 
But as I said before, Blosser and Mason and the line of cases that follow it say that the veracity of polygraph results are settled law. We do not need to relitigate that in every case. I think the best approach is once those results come in to give the jury a limiting instruction and tell them you can use this to determine whether or not the confession is credible. You do not use it to determine whether or not Johnny was speaking truthfully or untruthfully. So why wouldn't that limiting instruction be relevant or the state be able to use that type of limiting instruction when it wants to offer polygraph results? I, I don't understand how just having it in this instance, uh, just, I don't want to use a limit twice, but limits the state from introducing polygraph evidence in, in other types of cases and, hey, just give this limiting instruction and that'll cure it. Is that a problem? I don't think it is, Your Honor. And I, I cited to a number of federal cases in my supplemental brief where they, they really struggled with this issue. Um, and, and a lot of the case, the federal cases dealt with, um, you know, a, 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 a polygraph confession comes in, uh, the accused wants to and does take the stand and say, yeah, but I was in there for three hours and they told me I was lying over and over again and that's why I confessed. Well, that opened the door for the state to bring in the polygraph results. The reason they told you were lying is because you failed a polygraph, right? Well, yeah, that's where we ended up. So there is some door opening going on here. And here it's the state that opened the first door. The state opened the door for Johnny to bring in polygraph results here. And they did that by relying on a polygraph coerced confession. They did not have to do that. They had the accuser's testimony. They had additional evidence that they felt suggested that Johnny had committed these offenses. And they could have tried uh, this case based on that evidence. They chose to bring on the polygraph coerced confession and they created a lot of evidentiary headaches for the district court. One of, those, one of those headaches is the limiting instruction that at least was proposed. Um, and I wanna go back briefly to that because I'm not sure I even understand the limiting instruction. Uh, it seems to me that it, as you just recited it, it is that the evidence can be used to determine the credibility of the confession, but it can't be used to determine whether he's telling the truth. And aren't those the same thing? Isn't credibility the same thing as whether or not he's telling the truth? But it's the difference between the credibility of the confession. Do you believe this confession or do you think it's something that officers pried out of him? Well, whether they pried it out of him has nothing to do with whether it's true or not, does it? But it, it, it does have to do with whether or not you believe it. Help me. Help me understand that. Let's say that I confess to a crime that I didn't commit. All of the evidence at trial is completely inconsistent with my confession. Now, the jury has every right to say, well, I looked at him, I heard that confession, but I saw all of the other evidence sure. as well, and I just don't believe it to be true. So I'm going to return a verdict of not guilty. Uh, that's the extreme case. But this is essentially the same thing. The jury is going to hear the confession. The question is, do they believe it? And the jury needed to see all of the evidence that was out there. The jury needed to see how the sausage got made in this case. The jury needed to see what officers did to Johnny to get those words to come out of Johnny's mouth. And because they didn't, Johnny was denied the right to present a complete defense by presenting to the jury all of the circumstances that led up to his confession. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Assistant District Attorney Julie Kuhn on behalf of the state. Um, it is our position that the court properly exercised discretion in excluding the evidence of the polygraph exam. Um, the court's standard to review this decision is to admit, um, is to the decision to admit or exclude evidence is reviewed for an abuse of discretion, as this court knows. Additionally, the court exercises unlimited review over 
over whether the district court's decision to exclude evidence infringed upon a defendant's constitutional right to present his or her theory of defense. We agree with the Court of Appeals determination in this case that the exclusion of the polygraph evidence did not violate Mr. White's right to pre present a defense. Um, a defendant has the right to present his theory of defense, but that right is not unlimited. It's subject to re um, reasonable restrictions. There are policy reasons um, that this court is well aware that exist to protect the defendant um, and that is why the polygraph evidence doesn't come in. Because and let me ask you a question. Yes. Um, so the, the defendant relies primarily on the United States Supreme Court case of Crane versus Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And we even just recently cited the holding in that case in the um, uh, Khalil Asalami uh, in 2021. So in that case, they found that the trial court's exclusion of evidence surrounding defendant's confession violated his right to present a defense. And also in this case, there was a Jackson v. Deno hearing and they already determined it was voluntary. So the Supreme Court here is making a big difference between the voluntary and the credibility. And in that case, the defendant was 16 years old and he was not permitted to testify about his detention in a windowless room for a protracted period of time, being surrounded by as many as six police officers during interrogation, repeated, repeated denials to telephone his mother and being badgered. Um, and the court held it would be procedurally unfair if the state were permitted to exclude competent, reliable evidence bearing on the credibility of a confession when such evidence is central to the defendant's claim of innocence. How do you distinguish this case from Crane? Well, here we don't have a 16 year old. We have um, an older gentleman, if I recall. I don't recall his age. I have. Um, Basically, how do you distinguish it based on the law, not on the facts? Um, um, well, first of all, the polygraph evidence, the, this, these protections have been, been put in place to protect a defendant from the unreliability um, determined thought to, to go with polygraph and to um, the fact that juries, if this evidence goes to a jury, it takes them out of the truth finder because they would um, put too much weight on the results. Those what are the if the results, results were never given to them? I don't think the defendant is asking for the results to be published. What they're doing is saying, look, this, these are the circumstances surrounding our guy's confession. And the question is, is that confession, did he confess um, because he felt pressure and he lied or was his confession credible? And to that, um, you cannot divorce getting to that, the circumstances <coughs> from the results of the polygraph. Why not? Because in this case, um, defendant argues that he wanted to talk about the detectives telling them he was lying, which also brings up El Nicky. That wouldn't have come in anyway, because we cannot put on, um, that's an improper comment on defendant's credibility. We know that we couldn't have put that on. Additionally, he wants to talk about telling him he bombed the test. Well, both of those things necessarily deal with the results of the test. Um, Do they though? I mean, I guess I'm piggybacking on Justice Standridge's question. Is it, is this really polygraph evidence or is it evidence about what the defendant was told in the context of the confession? And I want to ask a hypothetical to get sure. to my point. What if law enforcement had faked it? They, they you know, they put scotch tape on his head with wires, right? You know, and they're like, we're telling, it's totally fake. Mm -hmm. um, could the defendant say, well, this is what they did to me. And, and I, I thought they had, you know, basically say what the defendant is saying they want to say, well, give the context of the confession. And in that hypothetical, there literally has, there never actually was a polygraph exam administered. That hypothetical actually gets me to another portion of my argument. Defendant wants you to do something here um, with the limited purpose exception 
that we can already do. All he well, had to I, do if, is- if, if, if you could, I don't want to stop you from going where you want to go, yeah. but I kind of want an answer to the question also. Like, why wouldn't the defendant be able to talk about that if that had happened? It's not really, we're not talking about polygraph evidence. We're talking about what the defendant was told by law enforcement, which is different, isn't it? If, if there indeed was no polygraph um, and at the same time, investigators, we have case law that says that um, they can use tactics or interview tactics to, um, to interview a defendant that don't have to be truthful. I believe that could possibly come in, um, but I still feel that that is different than the policy reasons we have behind actual polygraph evidence that are in place to protect a defendant. Um, at the same time- I guess where what I was, I'm, well, I'm sorry to cut you yes. off, but I get, again, to cut to the chase, I guess what I'm asking is why couldn't the defendant be permitted to testify as to the circumstances surrounding the confession and just leave it at that. Why, why isn't that the right way forward? I, I, I mean, I'll say, I don't know how it helps the defendant that much, but why shouldn't the defendant be allowed to do that? And I think he could have been allowed to do that if he stipulated to and waived his right. These protections are in place for him. No, if I'm not talking about bringing anything about the polygraph in about the, the examiner doesn't, none of that comes in because that's our case law, that's, mm -hmm. that's not admissible. I'm just asking what's wrong with letting the defendant testify. They told me I failed a polygraph exam. Because our case law um, from this court has said that no evidence regarding the giving, the taking, um, the results are to come in. That's now, so, so what's the, why does the state then utilize this, this test or, or even, even allow it to happen at all? If it's inherently unreliable, can't be admissible. What's the point of utilizing this as an investigative technique? I, I believe simply that it is used as an investigative technique, well, but it, it was it not, I, and the, the evidence bear, the record shows that he, this was, I believe this was brought up at a first interview and he agreed to do it. And then a couple of weeks later is when they went, um, gave him all of the required warnings and he still agreed to do it. Um, and the district court, as we've heard, they found that this was, there was a hearing, a motion to suppress Jackson v. Deno, that this was voluntary um, and there was no coercion involved. So I, I cannot speak to the broad question of why does law enforcement still use this, but I believe it is a tool that they have um, in, um, in their investigative toolbox that they can use. Um, so is it similar then to if, if you have uh, co-defendants and you've got the, the co-defendant in the interview room next door and say, Oh, your co-defendant has spilled the beans on everything we've implicated, you know, and um, in fact, we we bought him McDonald's to thank him. And then they walk him by the interview room. He can see that the guy has McDonald's. And so then he goes, OK, you know, I'm going to go confess. Would that information be able to come in? Because it sounds like what you're saying is the state uses this as a tool. Oh, you flunk, you know, I mean, they could have just as easily told him that he flunked the polygraph test when he didn't. I mean, they're, they're allowed to do that too. They're allowed to do anything. So why do, doesn't the context of this come in um, to use, you know, the constitutional right to present a defense without the, you know, whether a polygraph test is scientifically reliable is a whole separate issue. I, <laughs> again, um, 
it could have come in. I, all this defendant had to do was stipulate, I want this in because I, I will, and he had to do it at the district court. He, he had to expressly it. in it for, but that's the strange thing. I don't know how you divorce the circumstances from the results. What if because, the police lied and said you flunked, even though he didn't? But we don't have that here. Right, but I mean, isn't that the whole point? I, I, I don't think that's the point here. Well, we don't even know in the record whether, we don't know whether that's true or not here. Whether what's true whether he uh, didn't pass or not. It's not in the record. We, we, we have a full hearing on uh, the motion in Lemony, and I believe we have testimony um, that from, I, again, I didn't start with this case, so if I'm, the record would bear it out, but I believe we have information um, from the, that uh, at least Detective Ribble, that he had failed the polygraph. Um, and that's what Atterbury had um, communicated to him. I don't think we have anything in the record that indicates that these were detectives that were lying um, to Mr. White to, to I wasn't him. saying that. I was just more pointing out that, you know, what we rule in this case could apply to all cases. And I understand that. Um, but again, I don't think we need a new um, way to do things when in this case, if defendant wanted um, this, he could have stipulated at the district court, he could have made a very specific- Stipulated to what? To a, a waiver of the protections that we have for him. He could have stipulated to have this evidence come in- okay, so or, he has two or choices. waive the protections. The evidence comes in that shows that he did not pass or he could not do anything. But what, what the defendant seems to be asking for is somewhere in the middle, which to me, I'm really having trouble distinguishing Crane versus Kentucky on this one. Um, but somewhere in the middle of, I don't want the results to come in. I just want you to know that, you know, I was in a windowless room for a protracted period of time, surrounded by six police, you know, just the context of when he made his confession so that a jury, when he presents it to a jury, they can decide, you know what, he probably lied when he made that confession. But we also have a difference here in that when he confessed, he confessed to one of the counts and he denied the other. And we have a jury who acquitted him on the count that he denied. So the jury believed um, his denial and believed the count that he confessed to. This, this isn't a situation where it was a, he, he confessed to everything. He also didn't confess immediately. These officers didn't come in and say, you, you, you failed, you bombed. There were 20 to 30 minutes um, between the conclusion of that polygraph and when the detectives were, um, in there speaking with him when he finally said, she's telling the truth, she's not lying. But at the end of the day, isn't the defense asking under the limited use exception to put in front of the jury the fact that he did fail a polygraph exam, right? Isn't that real? Otherwise, how, how is the defendant explaining uh, sort of the incongruity between uh, the trial defense and what happened during the interrogation and right doesn't does, doesn't defense have to get the results in to explain um, explain away the explain away the confession I mean I would agree that yes you you can't have just part of it to 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 support his defense that the confession was coerced, I think you would necessarily have to have the results as well because Not otherwise- coerced, I'm sorry, but unreliable. Unreliable, yeah. sorry. Um, I, I think you would necessarily have to have the results because otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Well, why? So why do you, you have to, again, I guess this is where I don't understand this case, but as I, the defense argument is it's all about his state of mind. Whether he passed or failed is completely irrelevant. The only thing, as I understand it, the defendant is saying is, I wanted the jury to know that my state of mind was, 
I believed I had failed a polygraph test. And that's different. That's different from whether he actually quote unquote failed or didn't fail. It's really all about his state of mind. It is, but it's still, it, it's our position that it still gets into the results. And up until today, I believe the, the, the way I understood the argument was that they only wanted the circumstances. They did not want the results. They wanted to divorce these two from each other um, and, and only deal with these circumstances. Why, um, let me add just one more question. Why is the state so, you may not be able to answer this either, but why would the state be so upset if the defendant wants to tell the jury, they told me I failed a polygraph test? Like to me, that benefits the state. I just don't understand why the state would be so adamant that that can't happen. Well, it, and it could, but we have rules that we have to follow and these are put in place to protect the defendant. So as I argued, he could have waived these protections. Now you're trying to get the results in. And, and, I, and that goes back to, I don't think you can divorce the circumstances from the results in relation to this polygraph evidence. Uh, and that would be our position. If he wanted this to come in, he could have made a very explicit waiver, a proffer in the district court. There is no proffer as to how this was used. We, we only have, um, an argument on appeal now of how this was going to be used. There was no proffer before the district court. Um, so it is our position um, that his right to present a defense was not unlimited. Um, and I think we can, if this court goes to the uh, harmless analysis, if they determine that this was error, I think we can look to the fact that um, it's very important to look to the fact that he was acquitted on count two and the jury believed his denial, um, necessarily believing um, his confession. Additionally, the district court in that Jackson v. Deno hearing reviewed the length of the interview, the accusations of lying and all other circumstances um, and found that the circumstances surrounding this confession were not coercive. Before you sit down, um, mm -hmm. could you get to the last issue that I, that I think, at least how I have the last issue, and that is the evidence that was produced on the videotape confession from the prior trial. Mm -hmm. The Court of Appeals found that was error to allow that and then said it was harmless. First, uh, I you had a stipulation that there was the prior conviction. What was the point of, of uh, then uh, producing the, the videotaped confession? You already had the evidence that there was a conviction. Well, I, I can't exactly speak to what the thoughts were at the time of trial. Um, backing up to uh, the Court of Appeals decision, what I would note is that um, the Court of Appeals noted that it does not reweigh evidence and then assumed without finding that there was error. I will acknowledge we did not petition that, um, but it's well, not necessarily our position there was error, but I'll, I'll roll with. <laughs> well, you're gonna wanna roll with it, but yes. how, is it, how is it not? How is it harmless? I mean, how is it is harmless? Dramatic testimony. I, I understand. And powerful testimony on on it now that it's that was admitted testimony that was there. Well, it's not a situation that there was no evidence ever going to come in. This is a six. This is a a sex case with sixty four fifty five D propensity and, and, and evidence. And the stipulation to to the to the conviction. And so. that stipulation came late in trial. Um, and again, this is not a situation where no evidence would come in. It would have been the stipulation plus detective's testimony. There were three ways to get this evidence in. Um, a stipulation plus the detective's testimony, the video, or having that victim come in and testify to what happened. And I believe the, uh, the prosecutor at the time determined that, um, 
this was the middle ground between the three options that she had. Additionally, um, if you remove this video confession and replace it with a stipulation in detective, a detective's testimony, it's our position there'd be no difference in the outcome. The jury would have still weighed the evidence regarding the details of the current victim's allegation, the fact that defendant admitted to touching her, and then the fact that he had a prior conviction for the same offense with which he was currently charged. Um, Can I ask quickly on that videotape, was there evidence that, that a jury could have taken from the video uh, confession um, that established a course of conduct or similarities, parallels between the prior convictions and the course of conduct under the uh, most recently charged offenses that would not have been available through uh, the stipulation? I believe that's possible. I honestly have not, because I came into this late, seen the video, um, but I believe that was an argument at some point is that the, the some similarities uh, between the first victim and uh, the second victim. So ultimately it is our argument um, that there's no reasonable probability that the 2014 videotape evidence contributed to the verdict in an unfair manner, demanding reversal of Mr. White's conviction in this case, particularly given the fact that the jury opted to acquit him of the second charge that he was facing. If there are no other questions, uh, we would ask this court to affirm the Court of Appeals and the District Court. Questions. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Thank you. Fire, you reserve three minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. And I, I'd like to respond to some of the state's harmlessness arguments. First, as to the polygraph issue. I think the biggest thing here is that there is a direct line between what Johnny was polygraphed on, what Johnny confessed to, and what Johnny was convicted of. There were two accusations here both stemming from the same event. But the first was that Johnny touched his accuser. The second was that Johnny made his accuser touch her. He was polygraphed only on the first accusation that he had touched his accuser, not on uh, the accusation that he had made her touch him. That is exactly what Johnny confessed to. He did not confess to account that he did not fail the polygraph on. Also, that is exactly what the jury convicted him of. They convicted him only of the count that he was polygraphed on and only of the count that he, was conf uh, that he actually confessed to based on that polygraph. So there, it, it is very clear that this confession played a key role in the way these verdicts came down. On top of that, the state actually got up in closing argument and said that this was not an emotional beatdown. Johnny could not meet that argument. Johnny could not meet that argument because the state took active measures to prevent him from putting on the evidence that he needed to put on to meet the argument, to say that this was an emotional beatdown. They gave me an inherently unreliable test, told me I failed that, leveraged that into sympathy for this poor girl, and got me to confess. So absent the error in not allowing Johnny to present evidence bearing on the credibility of his confession, there is every reason in the world to believe that this case would have come out differently and the state cannot prove otherwise. I feel like we're, all right, I guess I feel like I'm shadow boxing in this case a little bit because we don't exactly know, this is extremely fact specific. We don't have Justice Stegall's hypothetical where the investigators faked a polygraph. Um, or just said you flunked the polygraph and the guy never took anything. I mean, you know. So it seems like you want to take this very highly radioactive prejudicial evidence. And that's why it doesn't come in. Because juries think that you hook up scientific things and it's got more credibility and you've got these professional officers. But walk me through, it feels like you wanna just say a little tiny bit 
and then keep the state from saying anything in you know to bolster or flesh out the details of this polygraph. For example, uh, Mr. White test would go in and testify, they told me I flunked the polygraph. And you want to give this limiting instruction that somehow the jury is supposed to block out that a polygraph really occurred and that he really flunked it. It seems like in response to that, the state would be able to get in to the notion of why would you think that statement had any force and effect on you? In other words, did you really sit down and take what looked like a polygraph? What did the investigators do? What'd they strap on you? Wasn't scotch tape, it was real equipment. And who sat across there? Well, it was, you know, it was uh, Agent Atterbury. Um, it seems like they build out this whole notion of the of the validity of this test just to lay out what really happened to this guy before he confessed. That just seems highly prejudicial. I can think that if the role was reversed and the trial court had allowed your client it allowed defense counsel the trial counsel to have done this to your client we'd be on a 1507 in a minute on an ineffective assistance of counsel this just i don't see how you keep this you know this is a pandora's box and i don't see how you keep pandora in the box by and, and it almost seems like you're, you're saying all he wants this much and they don't get to say anything and I don't think that's the way this gets to play out. The state has got to be able to probe why this guy would believe what these officers were telling him. And that's the danger here. And I don't see how limiting instruction prevents that prejudice. So that's my, you know, that's a, a, you know, a long response to what you've been arguing about, but tell me why I'm wrong. Your Honor, if I could. I think that's the wrong approach for two reasons. First, um, this is, as we've been talking about, this is, I don't think the argument below, and I don't think district court, court counsel was asking for it, and I don't think the district court itself saw this as the defense um, wanting to put in just, you know, just, just the few, you know, cherry pick the facts. This is what's good for us. This is what we want to come in. Um, and in fact, the district court said, I, I think in, when it was ruling on the motions and I'm reading here from my notes, but if the, the defense argument is if the court's in, inclined to allow the statement in, the jury needs to understand, oh no, I'm sorry. The defense requests that in the alternative to suppressing, I let everything in and give a limiting instruction, telling the jury how to find the court's polygraph unreliable. So yeah, we, we are asking for everything to come in. That's what we want. We want the jury to look at everything and to make a determination about whether or not this confession is believable. That's what didn't happen here. The second response I have is that if this is opening a Pandora's box, it's the state that opened the box. They did not need to rely on this polygraph coerced confession to, uh, to convict Johnny at trial. They had other evidence. They didn't have to try their case this way. And to the extent this creates difficult evidentiary problems, the solution to those problems cannot be to strip Johnny's right, his constitutional right under Crane versus Kentucky, to present a complete defense. So uh, we, is this, you know, is this the, is this the world's, uh, is this the defense that you would pick if you could pick any defense in the world? It probably isn't. But the reality here is that Johnny has to choose between not challenging his confession, which puts him in a virtually impossible place at trial, or taking the risk of letting the jury see how the sausage is made. And this is a case where Johnny wanted to take the risk of letting the jury see how the sausage was made. And Crane v. Kentucky says he needs to be able to do that 
the jury needs to weigh that defense. And if they're going to find him guilty, they need to find him guilty because they believe his confession uh, was accurate in spite of the tools that law enforcement used to extract. That's an, the whole universe of case law that says polygraph evidence is prejudicial to the defendant. Doesn't that whole universe of case law essentially make the state's harmlessness claim here a slam dunk? That, hey, even if the defendant had got what, what the defendant wanted, um, it, it would have helped the state. This is, there's no way that the defendant can demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt that the outcome would have been different. I, I disagree, Your Honor. There, there are true traditional rationales for keeping polygraph evidence out. One is that the results are unreliable. And here, that was Johnny's whole point. The whole point is that they used an unreliable test to convince him that he needed to confess. You bombed this polygraph. We know you're lying. This girl needs closure. You need to confess. So the polygraph's unreliability is the point that Johnny's trying to make. The second reason we typically keep polygraphs out is because they usurp the role of the fact finder. Now this machine is finding out who's telling the truth instead of the jury making the determination of who's telling the truth. We want everything to come in precisely because the jury needs this information to make a fully informed decision. Without hearing about how this confession came about, the jury can't decide whether or not it's credible. In the same way that, you know, we were talking about buying McDonald's for the co-defendant earlier. If the jury doesn't hear that that's what happened, and that's why somebody confessed to a crime, they have no way, they don't have the universe of facts they need to make a credibility assessment on that determination. And that is all that Johnny is asking for here, is to let the jury see everything, weigh the evidence, and decide whether or not they believe it. Would you comment on the, on the third issue and the harmlessness on that? Uh, or, I, or, or were you going to? I, 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 I got a little bit sidetracked. I was hoping I know to you get did. there. I know you did, but yeah, go ahead. Um, but yes, I, if this, I, I guess what I'll say is if this court has doubts about the harmlessness of that confession, watch it. This was a two clean Xbox confession. It went on for nearly an hour. Uh, Johnny described in some detail an offense committed with his granddaughter. He described in detail a suicide attempt based on his guilt and his shame resulting from that offense. Uh, he described himself as a monster. And if you watch that video, I don't see any way to disregard the very real possibility that the jury in this case would have been uh, intent on punishing Johnny uh, for what he did in an unrelated case. And I do not see how that error can be harmless on its own, and particularly when coupled with uh, the polygraph error uh, and with the amended complaint. If error. we agree with that, what do we do with the Court of Appeals assumed error? We have to send it back to the Court of Appeals. No, Your Honor, because I, 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 the, this court's rules say that uh, when the Court of Appeals assumes an error without finding it, it's on the uh, the agreed party to to cross petition or condition really? cross petition. I, okay. And that didn't happen here. So our position is we have the, a rule on assumed error. Well, as I can to found error. I think I've got the text of the rule here somewhere, but my memory is that it says. Maybe right. You may know the rules better than I do. I'm sure uh, you do, actually. If the Court of Appeals assumes an outcome on an issue without deciding it, the conditional cross petitioner must raise that issue to preserve it for review. So it's our position that the state has waived that argument at this point. Circling back, I'm sorry, but I, I, I never keep trying to keep us on <laughs> track. But in response to your to, in, to your last response before Justice Steagall asked on the prejudicial impact of this uh, prior video confession, the jury. I, I, so I want to hear your answer. The jury did acquit on this on one of the two counts. So it doesn't seem like a video that otherwise talked about him being a monster and all this prejudiced them because they were able to put that out of their mind and find him not guilty on one of the two counts. Seems like they would have 
have done a home run on, on this or not. Well, I don't think we can say that with a constitutional level of certainty because we do not know what was going on in that jury room. Maybe what was going on in that jury room was, well, we don't find these, uh, these offenses to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, but darn it, we want to punish this guy, so let's hook him up on one. Um, and we just have no way of knowing that that's not what happened, Your Honor. Questions? Or anything in conclusion? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you to both counsel for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement.